If you have your Bibles, turn with me to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Tonight I'd like to talk to you about look at the heart. Look at the heart. And our outline, number one, God's instructions to Samuel. God's instructions to Samuel. Number two, God's ways versus man's ways. God's ways versus man's ways. Number three, Samuel listens to God. And uh, by the way, it's always really, really good to listen to God. That is good advice. In uh, 1 Samuel, uh, we will see... Yeah, let me get over on the right page there. <laughs> we will see, and, and we know that uh, Samuel was an aging prophet of God, uh, that earlier he anointed King Saul as the first king of Israel. Uh, king Saul did okay as a king at first, but he made a huge mistake and directly disobeyed instructions from the Lord. It truly broke Samuel's heart when God told him to confront King Saul and tell him that God was going to take away his kingdom. King Saul stayed in office longer and grew further and further away from God and eventually contacted demon spirits. It was now time for Samuel to anoint a new king and to take King Saul's, to take king Saul's place as king of Israel. God gave Samuel specific instructions on how to find God's choice as Israel's new king. Let's look at that process from God's point of view. 1 Samuel Chapter 16, verse 1, now the Lord said to Samuel, and again, folks, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times in the Old Testament, God spoke in an audible voice, all right? Now God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. I know when God speaks to me. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, but he said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? And you remember, even the Verse before, uh, what he rejected him was uh, God told him uh, to go in and, and punish the uh, Amal uh, Amalek for what he did to Israel, uh, wipe out the towns, wipe out everything, men, children, boys, girls, everything, animals, and uh, he did not do that. He left some people alive, and uh, basically he, he blamed it on his people uh, and his soldiers, uh, but God held him accountable for not doing what he told him to do. And it says, And fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And I know probably in Samuel's mind, he felt somewhat responsible uh, for that uh, because a prophet, uh, as we know, always was Thus saith the Lord. And uh, that many times, and you know, the prophet would speak, God would speak to the prophet, and then uh, the king would hear and he would listen. And if the king was smart, he would obey what the prophet uh, has said. In verse 2, and Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, hears it, he will kill me. And again, you know, he was mourning over Saul, and he was basically telling, God was telling. Uh, Samuel, you know, the work must go on. You need to go on. And uh, God uh, spoke through him and, and told him. And what there was, was there just this kind of, you know, Saul got very, very upset with Samuel. And he just said, you know, I'll change. I'll, you know, I'll repent. I'll do this. But it had already been done. Uh, so, you know, Saul was kind of, you could see, you know, marks right off the bat that he was, he was starting to lose things, and he was losing it. Uh, he wasn't making good judgments. He wasn't, and, and he was very angry. He was very angry at, at, at Samuel uh, for what he was doing, and Samuel was simply obeying God. Verse 2, and Samuel said, how can I go? If he hears it, he will kill me. And we see later on in, you know, the story, I mean, he tried to take David's life three times, uh, so you know, he, he wasn't all there. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to uh, the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me 
the one I named to you. So he basically told him, you know, it's something that uh, the priest would do. They would go and they would sacrifice. And so it wasn't obvious. It wasn't, you know, uh, you know, if the people I saw, and Saul got just paranoid at times, and he would question, you know, motives and question people and why are they doing this. Uh, but God told Samuel, this will work. And uh, he went to Jesse uh, and, and said, invite them to come also. Now look, verse 4. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peacefully? And that's where the tension was between King Saul and Samuel. Uh, because King Saul did his best to try to talk Samuel out of doing that and talk him out of of delivering the message and and so you know there was this tension there and you know for all he knew he had come you know to, to, to pronounce something on uh, King Saul but uh, Samuel told him no I'm coming in peace and he said peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord which again that was very common in those days sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice and basically sanctify is you know, you, you clean yourself up. You literally uh, take a bath, okay? Put on new clothes, put on good clothes, and come to the worship. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So God gives specific instructions to Samuel. Look at Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. I love this these verses right here. And, and folks, we as Christians should be able to hear from God. We should be able to discern when God is talking to us, and maybe uh, in our own minds we want something, and 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 you know we just say, "Well, God told me," and He may or may not have told us. Okay, a lot. Of, some sometimes people do that. Uh, they give God credit for something that they really, really want in their life. <coughs> Excuse me. For I know the thoughts that I think to you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And folks, God wants what's best for us. God wants what's best uh, for his children. And Samuel, while it was hard to deliver that news, God clearly spoke. And folks, I, it, it just tells us that if we truly spend time in prayer, if we spend time in the Word, then God will speak to us through His Spirit or even through the Word of God. It says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Folks, God hears every prayer of yours. God hears every prayer. And I can even say this, God answers every prayer. Now, He may not, get you, he may not give you the answer right then, because he could say, yes, you can have it. He can say, no, you know, you don't need it. Or he can say, and this is the one we don't like, wait. You just wait. But here, he specifically told Samuel, you go and, and find the king in, in Jesse's family. And it says, and you will seek me and find me when you search, with, search for me with all your heart. Folks, God's not hiding from us. Okay, He wants a personal relationship with us. He wants an intimate relationship with us. It's not a puzzle. Okay, It's not a maze. It's not hide and seek. Okay, If you will pursue God, if you will pursue God through prayer and Bible reading and meditation and just speaking, not just speaking to the Lord, but listening to the Lord, you can find Him. Now, Isaiah 55 I know Paul used this the other night, but uh, I had this already written, and I'm going to go ahead and, and go over it again. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Now think about that. Seek the Lord. When can you find him? 24-7. Seven, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. God never sleeps, and he never slumbers. Call upon him while he is near. He's always near to a Christian. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly 
pardon. And in this case, he did not pardon Saul. Paul, I mean, uh, Saul somewhere crossed the line. Okay, there is a place uh, in, uh, you know, in people's lives where, where they have not truly repented, where they are doing the same thing over and over again, and God said, enough's enough. I'm not going to forgive you. Okay, I'm going to punish you. And that was exactly what was going on. But here in verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, as says the Lord. For as high as the heaven are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts, uh, thoughts than your thoughts. Folks, God's always thinking higher, higher than us. Okay, he's, he's always thinking spiritual things. He's always looking out for you. And while Samuel had this fear and someone interpretation in his life, I am telling you, when God speaks, you need to answer that call, and you need to do exactly what God tells you to do. And again, in, even in my work and in my vocation, you know, God has told me twice to move, and it was. I am just telling you to move from Lawton, Oklahoma, to Alma, Arkansas. I'm just telling you, didn't even know where Alma was. Only person I knew in the church was the pastor, Bob Shelton. But I knew in my heart of hearts that was what I needed to do. Same thing over here. When I came here, it was in my heart. So when God tells you something, folks, follow your heart. Even, even my parents, when they came in here, they helped me move into my office. That little board in the back was there, and they looked at me and they said, are you sure? That, that's my own parents, you know, almost questioning me. But I'm telling you, uh, if you will seek God with your, your whole heart, he will show you his ways. Now, let's look at verse 6. So it was, when they came, that he, they looked at Eliam, and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Again, Jesse had eight sons. Only seven of them are listed here. One died somewhere along the way. But the most logical one was the firstborn. Okay, the firstborn. Why? Because he had the birthright. Uh, usually he was, he was more mature. And, and, and Samuel, looking at him, just thought, this is the one. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And again, uh, you know, we do this in our own lives. I'll never forget, I went to Glorietta just as a young youth minister, and we went to Sunday school week there. And I was standing in line in the cafeteria, and uh, we were eating lunch, or getting ready to eat lunch, and some guy was in there, and just the way he was dressed, you know, in my own mind, and I didn't say anything to anybody, but I thought he was kind of nerdy looking. Okay, you know how <laughs> youth ministers are. We, we just sometimes, we, we have these crazy thoughts in our heads. Uh, and, and so I just thought, and, and the sweater he had on, you know, that wasn't a new, you know, and even stylish. Well, I go to the service that night, and you know who it was? It was Joel Gregory preaching. And I'm telling you, when he, sp he had the deepest voice I think I've ever heard in a man. And when he got up and started, he was preaching the text in 1 Thessalonians about the rapture of the church, and I was spellbound. I mean, it was like, oh my goodness. And folks, we do that in our own lives. We look at someone or a situation, and we think we've got it figured out. But folks, many times, I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter what a person looks like, okay? What matters is what's inside that person. This is the same thing in sports. I coached, uh, you know, I was a part of teams all my life. I coached some of my, my son's teams, and you, you take basketball, and you get five guys that think they're God's gift to basketball, they all want to shoot. They don't want to play defense. I would rather have five guys that are sold out to defense than five guys that don't want to, you know, get mad because somebody shot the, you know, the deal. And, and what you have to do, folks, is the heart tells you many things about a person. The heart. And that's what he's saying here. 
He says, don't look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. The Lord does not see as man sees. For God looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And you know, Samuel probably, uh, even, even in the earlier decision that he made, made this mistake the first time. And, and even with God, it's not always the most logical. I mean, a lot of people want to do the logical thing. And, I, and I'm not saying we should be illogical, but not everything. God's not, you know, he's not in a box, right? He's not confined. God can use anyone. This is what I'm trying to say. Anyone that is sold out to him, anyone who has their heart given to him, anyone that has a heart after God, they can use them mightily. Doesn't matter where they come from, doesn't matter who their parents are or how much money they have or even their education. Billy Sunday had very little education, folks. But yet, I'm telling you, God used him mightily. Look at 1 Samuel 9. Just go back a few chapters. 1 Samuel 9, verse 1. There was a man of Benjamin, whose name was Kish, the son of Elibit, and uh, Zerora, the son of, and all these folks there, keep going, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power, and he had a choice, and a handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of their people. And you would have looked at Saul in those days and thought, oh wow, that dude's big. Oh wow, he's a good looking guy. I think he'll make a great king. And folks, I'm telling you, there are people, I'm tell, even, you know, you were in high school and you were in college, and there were girls and guys that thought they were God's gift to the dating life. And I'm telling you, man, I got, a, I got as far away from those folks as I can. Why? Because you can't make them happy, all right? They, they, I mean, they're always primping in them. They're always doing it that. You know, their whole thing is about their appearance. And folks, when it comes to godly things, God looks at the inside of you, the heart. And that is so important. He looks at the heart. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Go with me to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4.12. The Bible says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and of the joints and the marrow. And you have to understand, the word of God now is the written word but back then, it was also the spoken word. That's what the prophet did. Thus saith the Lord. Okay? And so, it's, it's both is what I'm trying to say. And here's the deal. And is the discerner of the heart and, and intents of the heart. And folks, there are a lot of people that don't have discernment. And I cannot tell you how important discernment is. That's knowing the mind of God. That's knowing the will of God. That is seeking the will of God. That is knowing when something, I'm not sure what's right here, but I'm just, I, something's not right here. And it says, <coughs> excuse me, and joints and marrow and is discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And then one more, First Chronicles chapter 28. First Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9. And again, this is Solomon. This is King Solomon. It says, For you, my son Solomon, David speaking to Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. And I'm all for education, folks. I think knowledge is good. I think a biblical education and foundation is good. But I still say, these guys and these, these bivocational pastors that lived you know, out in the country and had a church that ran about 40 or 50 and were just loyal to their congregation, I believe they will have as big a reward as those who had mega churches and ran thousands. Because God is looking at their heart and they, many of them, have a loyal heart with a willing mind. For the Lord, the Lord searches <clears throat> all the hearts and understands the intent of the thoughts. 
Folks, God knows our motivation. God knows why we do what we do. God knows even before we do it what we're going to do, if you think about it. If you seek Him, He will be found by you. But if you forsake Him, He will cast you off forever. And folks, we can't always go. It's kind of like a resume. All right? And there are times, even when I talk to Christian people, you know what they do? They give me their spiritual resume. Okay, they tell me everything that they've ever done for God. And, and, and God tells us not to do that, folks. All right? Where do you want your reward at? You want your reward here, or do you want your reward in heaven? All right, we're not impressing God by having a spiritual resume. Uh, folks, we need to just seek God's will, seek God's heart with all we are. Now, let's look at this last part. God instructions to Samuel, God's ways versus man ways, and Samuel listens to God. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the young men here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping sheep. Now, isn't that like God? All right? Not the firstborn, not the oldest, not possibly the most mature. Okay? What does he take? He takes the youngest one, the youngest one, and he takes a sheep herder. Okay, folks, again, in looking at the heart, sometimes we, even as Christians, look down on people. And, and I, I'm telling you the truth when I share this with you. When I was younger, you know what I wanted to be when I was a little kid? A trash man. God is my witness. I thought, that is a cool job. You just ride around on a truck, you just pull up the deal, you chunk it in there, and you get on and you ride some more. And... I mean, in our own lives, we'd just say, oh man, you had, high, you had high hopes, didn't you? Well, folks, I'm just telling you, we need trash men. Okay, we need people down in the muck. We need people willing to do those things. Okay, so never look down on people. Never try to be more spiritual than someone else. Never try to toot your own horn and, and make people think that you're you know, something that you're not. Because when you look at this and what you see, man, God is going to use David, a sheep herder, to destroy Goliath later on. I mean, when he came up to that battle and that Philistine was cussing his God and he was young, he tried to put on Saul's armor. He couldn't even wear it. The armor weighed more than he did. He said, get that stuff off me. And he got five stones. And folks, we know what he had done. And we know who he became. Folks, he became the king of Israel. The king of Israel. And it says, and Samuel said to Jesse, send him and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. Samuel wasn't taking no for an answer. He was just saying, hey, the sacrifice is over, but we're just going to sit here till dark if we have to. So he sent and brought him in. And he was ruddy with bright eyes. You know, a lot of people pass up the bright eyes thing. But folks, I'm telling you, your eyes tell me everything about your life. You can ask Steve. We can almost go into a hospital bed right now, or into a hosp hospice unit, and we can almost tell you how long that person's going to live because of their eyes. Life is in the eyes. And you know what drives me crazy? And it's just a personal thing of mine. When people talk to me and won't look at me, Folks, when someone talks to you, you need to look them in the eye. Because you're saying what you're saying is important. And the bright eye, you know what that means? It means enthusiastic. It means, you know them little puppy dogs that <laughs> just go around like that? And man, they're just going around in circles. They're just going like that. Or water bugs, you know, bugs going like that. Now let me ask you, which kind of person do you want to serve the Lord with? Which kind of person do you want to follow? 
Someone that just, oh yeah, no, we tried it before at this church. Uh, it, it, it's not going to work. Or somebody that just, hey, point me the way. Show me the way. Give me, give me a job to do. Let's get going. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him. For this is the one. I'm telling you, God's chosen man. This is the one. And Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And of course, the oil was <clears throat> uh, another sign of the anointing was uh, uh, that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was upon that and upon him. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, and from that day forward, so Samuel rose and went to Ramah. You know the neat thing, and I'll close with this, Acts chapter 13, go to Acts 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 20. Because I was looking for this verse, and matter of fact, I had to, Chuck, Chuck found this verse for me. I, I was looking and looking, and you know how sometimes you just look, you look, and you look, and you can't find it? And I said something to Chuck, and about two minutes later, here it is, you know? So it's good to have Chuck in the office. Verse 20, and, and again, Paul is giving the Jews a history of Israel. We don't have time to go through all that, that was going on, but he's giving history here. In verse 20, after that, he gave them judges, okay, and we're, again, historically Old Testament, for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet, and afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for him David as king, to whom he, he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And think about that, folks. What was David? David was king of Israel. What, what, where was David born? Historically, he was born in Bethlehem. Where was Jesus born? What are you saying? Folks, I'm telling you, the very one that he anointed was going to be the Savior of the world. Folks, you can't look at somebody and tell, them, tell what they are going to be or what they turn out to be. And sometimes we sell people short. We sell people short. And in my own life, and, and, and you know, Jonathan and I, we've, we've had our differences when he was younger, and he did some boneheaded things when he was younger. But I'm telling you, I'm very proud of who he is now and what he has become. And he, he's what I call a late bloomer. Okay, a late bloomer. All right. But I'm just saying, folks, don't give up on people. Don't give up. Don't judge people by the outside. Okay, God may have some awesome plans. Okay, don't always get the best looking, the richest, or the ones that have the most influence. Okay, look for those people that love God and that seek God and want to please God with all their heart. Folks, that's, that's a good business practice also, by the way. If I was a Christian business owner, I'm not saying I wouldn't hire a lost man, but I'm simply saying I'd really, really, uh, in the interviews and all that was going on, I would really look and try to discern their hearts. Because, folks, God's got a plan for everybody. It's never too late. Folks, even the thief on the cross, you talk about a, a bed, you know, bedside decision, a last-minute salvation. But God still said to him, he was, he was a thief and a murderer, but yet he said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. So folks, history, biblical history proves it's not where you start. David was a sheep herder. It's how your heart is. It's, it's how close you are to God. Folks, I would love to be described, and on my epithet, a man after God's own heart. And that's what God said about David. Father, thank you for the day. And God, I thank you that uh, you don't look at the outside. God, I thank you that you look at the heart. And God, the Proverbs tells us, uh, from the heart, 
really all issues of life come from the heart. And God, I even think it's salvation. God, we have to give our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ. And God, I pray that uh, in everything that we do, that we would listen to you, that we would uh, try to please you in all that we do. And God, I know man's way sometimes seems the right way, but God, I pray that we would always follow our heart. God, thank you for, for just uh, stories like this uh, where you can see it really doesn't matter who your dad is or what you have or what your start was. God, we can go back to several people in history where they literally were dirt poor. But yet, God, they invented things. They become spokespersons for you. And they become, you know, just great men and women of God. So, God, I pray that we would just listen to you in all that we do. And God, I pray that we would just give people the benefit of the doubt and I pray that we'd be people of second and third chances. God, sometimes it just takes a little longer. God, I pray that our hearts would be in tune with your heart. And God, I pray that we won't look at the outward appearance, but we will look at the heart. God, I thank you that you teach us that in your word. And I thank you, Lord, for a lesson like this. And God, we love you, we praise you, and God, we just love you studying your word and teaching your word and preaching your word so god i pray that this would just be a great example for us to use for others lord i just know in life situations like these are going to come up god i pray that we will remember this lesson tonight and, and that we will be mentors and teachers of the word of god and, and of, of god's heart god we give you the glory the honor and the praise in jesus name we pray amen we thank you for joining us this evening at Rahel Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.